apologies for that. <coughs> Thanks for having me. Today I'm going to be speaking about data integrity and geological understanding. There is a tendency for mineral resource reports to be filled with content relating to grade estimation with very little discussion of the input data in geology. Given their importance, today's presentation is focused on common issues with both that I've come across in my career that often lead to flawed resource estimates. So it's a bit of a simplification, but resource estimation workflow is often composed of three stages, a data review, geological and structural modeling, and then grade estimation. Typically, the division of labor looks something like this, where a limited amount of time is spent understanding the data that's collected and using it to generate a robust geological model with the majority of the time spent on sometimes complex geostatistics to manage difficult data. And to clarify, we're not talking about data collection. That can take years. I'm trying to show the amount of time it's taken to understand the data. I'm of the opinion that more labor should be spent on understanding the data and the geology of a deposit. When proper attention is paid to these first two stages, often resource estimation and the underlying geostatistics are much simpler and therefore quicker. I don't want to negate the importance of good geostatistics, nor do I want to give the impression that there's no need for them. I simply want to emphasize that a robust geological model based upon reliable, well-understood data should result in a better resource domains um, with single populations and possibly single orientations. So I'm going to just cover the first two stages there's not enough time in 15 minutes to cover all three, and there are people far better qualified to cover just statistics here, so I'll leave it up to them. Let's have a look at some common data issues. <coughs> For the majority of the section, I will be dealing with drill hole data, but surface observations and samples are equally important when building a geological <coughs> model. Um, as a minimum for drill hole data, be it air core or diamond drilling. Um, Collar, downhole, survey, assay and lithology information should be collected. It's a common misconception that that's all that's required. Additionally, and in no particular order, you should capture density, structural data, mineralogical observations, alteration styles, weathering styles, and whatever else is important for your deposit. Perhaps magnetic susceptibility for iron ore or graphite flake size. Most importantly, all data needs to be located in three, be it a downhole lithological contact or a surface mapped contact. We deal in 3D models, which are converted into 3D grade estimates. And there are very few cases where a polygonal estimate is acceptable best practice. I can only think of perhaps in situ leach for uranium. Surface mapping should give you an idea of what you're investigating below surface. Drill holes should be planned to intersect geological features perpendicular to strike, but it's always good to see a few holes that are oriented differently to investigate things. Um, we live in an age where it's very easy to collect 3D data. Even your phone does it. So make sure that all observations are located in 3D. During my career, there has been a movement away from qualitative logging. Um, where each geologist would complete detailed descriptions of a rock type, often resulting in five names for one lithology. So it's good to have the description, but also good to have some overall rules. Um, with the inception of digital logging and drop-down lithotype menus, this has reduced. Um, most well-organised sites now have a rock type board, and I've got an example coming up, showing examples of the most common rock types to assist with consistent logging. But there will still be issues with any historic data sets that you might have, um, and they might require detailed review of existing logging or sometimes relogging of core if it's available. Your logging should, of course, identify areas of sampling for collecting assays, density, and metallurgical data. So there is a lovely rock type board from Chelfetch. I'm afraid most of it's in Russian. It's often not practical or cost effective to sample the entire hole from its collar. Whatever decisions are made regarding where samples should be taken, this needs to be clearly documented. Sample size should be recorded from your drill bit size to the resultant sample split. And if you're selectively sampling, 
you need to think about how far into the football and hanging wall you want to collect data. Um, I can't overemphasize the importance of proper document documentation, especially for missing data. Often resource estimation is undertaken by someone who's not collected the data and may not understand the coding or any assumptions you've made. It's very important to investigate any relationships between grade and recovery of your sample to check you're not preferentially losing mineralization or gang. Sometimes over the course of exploration, multiple analytical techniques have been used, which may not be comparable or have detection limits that don't encompass your data's upper and lower bounds. Be aware that some commodities require more than one analysis technique to properly quantify the recoverable portion of the resource. Total analysis methods may not always be representative of the economic portion of mineralization due to issues around metallurgical recoveries. Your analysis method should be considered according to its suitability and style and, ten and the style and tenor of mineralization. So most people are aware about copper versus copper sulfide. Um, but you also have to consider the same for gold and refractory minerals, or tin, potentially. It comes down to the mineralogy of the deposit, which mineral hosts the metal of interest, and can it be extracted? Geometallurgy is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, and it's becoming more and more important. Our exploration team now recommends that multi-element, four-acid, ICP, MS, geochemistry, spectral and qualitative, sorry, quantitative logging data is collected routinely. And it's used to identify mineralogical species, alteration and weathering data. It assists in building a whole geology model to better quantify what portions of the model can be recovered, to assist in building a more robust geological and mineralized domains, and to identify any risk areas, for example, areas of deleterious elements. I find that density is often overlooked, especially for early stage projects. To really add value, one should consider how the different rock types and mineralization styles could affect density and ensure that appropriate measurements are collected for all important data sets. You should consider collecting data for each rock type, mineralization style and weathering phase, including waste. Um, and often oxide material is underrepresented as it's poorly consolidated and difficult to sample. You do need to consider voids when you're looking at density sampling. Quality assurance protocols and quality control data should be interrogated in real time with deficiencies investigated and corrected. And that last bit's the important bit. Furthermore, QC data can and should be collected for lots of different data types, not just for sampling and analytical data. All tools can be subject to drift and come malfunction. And it's important to undertake QC measurements to check if this is happening. I've worked on um, uranium projects where they have their own test pits on site so they can check their gamma probes day by day. And they're fairly simple to build, but very valuable. Uh, as an example of alternate QC data that you can collect, um, this is confidence criteria in oriented core. So your core is coded during markup according to the confidence in your core in orientation mark where a higher confidence is applied to groups of orientation marks that align with one another in the driller's markings. It provides quite valuable information about which measurements can be relied upon and which may need to be removed from the data set when reviewing structural measurements. There's a lot of noise at level three, but as you move through, you suddenly see more of a pattern. So I'll briefly cover some common issues we've encountered with geological models, but I'd like to focus on one project where our clients investigated a number of issues with positive effects on the project. Generally, if the understanding of structural geology is poor, the resultant mineralized domains contain mixed populations, um, where you've got high-grade and low-grade material being mixed. Uh, in some cases, there's no geology model. Uh, resource domains are defined based on grade alone. The better you understand the geology of your deposit, the higher the confidence you'll have in the resource estimate, um, and therefore, theoretically, the higher resource classification you'll get. So I'm going to talk about a gold deposit in Central Africa. I'm not allowed to name it. Um, but it, it represents a project I worked on collaboratively for possibly three months, I think. Um, I, I was building the geology and mineralization models. So it was a, uh, our client identified a large gold deposit in Central Africa, which was poorly understood. It had a high tonnage, low-grade resource estimate, 
And the last resource was com completed in 2012, um, and 2012, if anyone remembers, was a fairly rubbish year for gold. Uh, it was an interesting project where they felt they could add significant value. And I'm hoping I can get a little movie to play. There we go. The model was based on some simple geological assumptions. Mineralisation was bound by broad stratigraphic units of chert or sandstone. The units were located around a steep northerly plunging fold hinge. Um, no separate geology model was available for review or structural model. Uh, these are the resource domains, and they were based on a 0.4 gram per tonne gold cutoff. Our client acquired the project, and the first thing that they did was spend their most experienced exploration geologist, um, a gentleman with 30 plus years exploration, that's uh, very experienced to site. He spent two months on site, uh, undertaking surface mapping, relogging keyholes, just space throughout the deposit. And during this time, it became clear that there was a much higher level of complexity than was applied in the re previous resource model. Um, they believed that the integration of geology and structure into a new resource estimate showed a path to our value. They planned infill drilling to test the model and to increase confidence in the resource. And this is the same model with a bit more detail. First, they identified a number of structural events. The early northeast faults are uh, mineralized with the, the east-west faults being later and offsetting. Second, they, uh, <laughs> in the drill call, they identified 11 stratigraphic cycles, the earliest being chert rich in blue, moving through to sandy material in yellow and silty material in olive green. And as you can see, it still follows the, the fold hinge. So you've got three broad stratigraphic groups within volcaniclastic end members. Uh, within this framework, it was possible to generate two separate mineralised domains relating to stratigraphic mineralisation or fault-hosted mineralisation. And these were based on uh, 1.5 gram per tonne gold cutoff. And it's just going to spin around for you. <coughs> so you can see it's a little bit more detailed. And I think you can just about see mineralisation cross-cutting one another where the faults and the stratigraphy interact. It's difficult to compare the two resource models by contained ounces, as the new mineralisation domains didn't cover the same area as the previous model. But what is important to note is the increased confidence in the new model. We went from indicated and inferred to measured indicated and inferred, which has implications for mine planning and project value. This increase in confidence demonstrates the value of an experienced geologist relogging and remapping based on a standard set of criteria and the importance of linking everything into the model um, really added value here and it highlighted further opportunities that may have previously been overlooked. I can confidently say, because I did most of this work, um, <laughs> that this project got the balance right. The geology model was very hard to build I think there were 12 separate fault blocks. Um, it took lots of time, and we were constantly reverting back and forth to site to get them to check this drill hole, check that drill hole, change the model, test the next bit of the puzzle. The mineralisation wireframes, in comparison, were fairly quick to build for that size deposit. Um, and the resource, while still complex, was then supported by robust domains that weren't subject to population mixing. So just as a bit of a summary, and this is an overused analogy, I'm sorry, but it's a good one. Anything built on poor foundations is prone to failure. So any resource estimate that's produced from poorly understood data in geology is bound to have flaws. The more time spent understanding these two key principles, um, the better you will understand your resource, the confidence you can apply to it, and the things you need to investigate to increase the confidence moving forwards. Geology is not only a key input into resource models, it can also be an input into areas that traditionally may not be considered geological. And my colleague, Maria O'Connor, will be speaking later today about the benefits of not working in isolation, but allowing people from all disciplines to communicate and add value to a project. Thank you for your time.
Fantastic. Thank you very much.